It is time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's sure. Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the Premier, uh, twas the last question period before Christmas when all through the House the ministers were retiring but scandals they couldn't do without. They see the waste highlighted with the auditor with care. Will the Premier admit her hydro plan is unfair? You see it, please? You see it, please? Start the clock. Premier. <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, um, in the spirit of the question, I want to wish everyone in, uh, in this House a very happy holiday and a Merry Christmas, Mr. Speaker. And, and to all of the people of the province at this time of year, um, whether it's Hanukkah, whether it's uh, Christmas, uh, celebration of light, celebration of light in darkness is really important. And so uh, I hope everyone has an opportunity to spend some time with the people who they love the most. And now in, uh, in response to, uh, to the um, verse from the cross the way, Mr. Speaker, I will just say, I will just say that uh, our plan to uh, help people with their uh, electricity costs, our plan to make the system more fair for people uh, in urban centres and in rural centres, Mr. Yes, Speaker, uh, is just that. It is fair, and it is uh, meaning that people are get, seeing an average of a 25 percent reduction in their hydro bills. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Halliburton, Fort Lakesbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The ministers have briefing books reading with dread. While well, visions of scandal dance through their heads, the Premier envisions ways the opposition she'll trap. Why won't she close the education skills gap? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, the, uh, in terms of in terms of education in this province, you know, we're today we are uh, we're celebrating um, the the move towards. Um, recognizing, supporting, funding uh, the Aboriginal Technical Institutes, Mr. Speaker. Um, we have students in, uh, in this province who are enjoying free tuition. We are um, putting into our, uh, into our curriculum experiential learning and working with unions and working with um, business, Mr. Speaker, working with corporations to provide learning opportunities for young people. We have put in place more supports for uh, young people to get jobs and support employers to hire young people so mr speaker in fact in fact uh, education is a priority for this government it always has been Answer. and it is why mr speaker we see companies coming to this province because of our highly skilled workforce final supplementary the member from the pn carlton the lawn there rose such a matter members sprang from their chairs to see what's the matter away to the chamber they ran in a flash will the treasury stop paying for partisan ads with taxpayer cash Thank you. Thank you. I have some editors and critics here mr speaker <laughs> the uh, the uh, the verse from the other side um, mr speaker as the uh, as the member knows uh, this is the only province in the country, this is the only government in Canada that has in place rules around uh, advertising, Mr. Speaker, that we have put in place because, because of egregious breaches of uh, partisanship in the past, Mr. Speaker. And so we're very, very committed to that. We have rules in place about partisan advertising, Mr. Speaker, and those will stay in place because we believe, and we are the first government to put those in place, and we believe that it's important that government advertising not be partisan. That's why those rules are in place. Thank you. New question. The, the member from Nipissing. The Premier Speaker. The families were nestled, ice cold in their beds while 12 per cent more hydro cuts danced in their heads. They prayed for relief from cold and from cough. Can you please, Premier, promise you won't cut their hydro off? 
Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In keeping with the Christmas theme, it's only that party that's talking about coal, which is something that Santa gives to naughty people, Mr. Speaker. And it's that side that's getting all the coal this year, Mr. Speaker. Especially when you look at our hydro plan. Our hydro plan gives a 25% reduction on all bills for families and as many as a half a million small businesses and farms, Mr. Speaker. And now, in their, their uh, you know, People's Garnishy, um, thank you for the MPP for Ancaster for that, in the People's Garnishy, they're now sneakily including our own platform in their bill, Mr. Speaker. So what is it, Mr. Speaker? Are they sticking with coal or do they want to stick with green, Mr. Speaker? On this side of the House, we're sticking with green. We want to ensure that our system is clean and reliable Answer. and green so that we can continue to breathe clean air, not coal, Mr. Speaker, like that they're putting Thank in you. everyone's stockings. Hey, hey. Yeah. You see it, please? <laughs> Supplementary. Member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. So the Minister of Energy rises to spin in QP. People are asking for relief. We all hear the pleas. But instead, the minister rises and spins with a bluster. Again, will they give 12% off bills is the question we must hear. Hear, Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We're actually giving 25% off, Mr. Speaker. That's something that they voted against, and so they can bluster and moan all they would like, Mr. Speaker, but we're making sure that we're helping families in this province. We're making sure that at the end of the year that people have seen a lower hydro bill, Mr. Speaker. Not unlike what they did, Mr. Speaker, where they vote against it every single time. They vote against making sure that we have a clean system. They vote against voting that we give people a reduction. Mr. Speaker, and when you look at their plan, even, even the independent energy analysis are saying all of these new costs will put pressure, Mr. Speaker, on making sure that we can continue to invest in hospitals, invest in schools, invest in roads, Mr. Speaker. Building this province up is what we have been doing, Answer. and we, Mr. Speaker, will make sure that we can do this with a clean, reliable, and an affordable electricity system. Thank you. Final supplementary, the member from dufferin Calvin. Now, Energy, Environment and the Minister of Finance, even Infrastructure, Ekdev and the member from Grant. Around the caucus room they say, will you introduce long-lasting energy relief today? Yes, sir. Thank you much, uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. We introduced long-lasting energy reductions, Mr. Speaker, in July. They're now talking about doing something, Mr. Speaker, that will not reduce anybody's bills, Mr. Speaker. It's actually going to make it more difficult for people. At the end of the day, when you're talking about $12 billion in cuts, Mr. Speaker, $12 billion in cuts, what are they going to cut? What's programs, Mr. Speaker? When it's talking about energy, are they going to cut the Ontario Electricity Support Program that helps low-income individuals? Are they going to cut the First Nation Answer. delivery uh, tax? Uh That's enough. Wrap up, please. Mr. Speaker, are they going to cut the First Nations delivery tax credit? You know what, Mr. Speaker, we've seen this before, just like the Harris years, Mr. Speaker. They're going to cut and slash Thank everything. You. That's what they're known for, Mr. Speaker. We can guarantee that. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I want to start by, um, on behalf of Ontario's New Democrats, wishing everyone the best of the holiday season and a Merry Christmas, and urging people to remember those in our communities that are struggling. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. For more than a year, I've been hearing the heartbreaking stories of Ontario families who are being forced to re receive their medical care in public hallways and storage closets and shower rooms inside our overcrowded hospitals. And for more than a year, this Premier has said everything is fine, and she and her health minister have accused anyone criticizing them of fear-mongering. But just yesterday, the Ontario Hospital Association said that our hospital system is indeed on the brink of crisis. When will this Premier finally admit that the hallway medicine crisis in Ontario hospitals isn't fear-mongering? It's what patients across this province are experiencing each and every day. Mr. Speaker, we have been very clear on this side of the House that we recognize that there is more that needs to be done in health care consistently. Every year we have made changes, we have increased funding. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, to suggest that somehow we've been complacent and we have uh, not recognized that there are challenges is just not 
the case. It's not true, Mr. Speaker, and we have demonstrated that concern by, in our last budget, uh, increasing funding to hospitals by $500 million, Mr. Speaker. We have demonstrated that commitment by, in uh, the recent weeks, working to solve the problem of the, uh, the surge of need uh, because of the flu season, Mr. Speaker, opening beds, uh, making sure that that capacity is expanded. So on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we are consistently looking for solutions, working with organizations like the Ontario Hospital Association, yes, working with nurses, working with doctors, Mr. Speaker, to suggest that we've been complacent is just not accurate. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, they haven't been complacent. They brought hallway medicine to Ontario. That's what they did. Doctors, nurses, patients and families have been pushing the Premier and her minister to take action on the overcrowding crisis at every opportunity. It's not a surge, Speaker. Beginning in May 2016, we started to release evidence of severe overcrowding in hospitals such as Toronto Sick Kids, London Health Sciences, Hamilton Health Sciences, the Sioux Area Hospital, Peterborough Hospital, Scarborough, Ottawa Hospital, Thunder Bay's Hospital, Sudbury's, Brantford General, Etobicoke General, and of course Brampton Civic, and many, many more. After more than a year of hearing just how bad this crisis is, why is the Premier still ignoring it? Proceeded, please. Proceeded, please. Premier. Mr. Speaker, putting $500 million into the budget is not ignoring the problem. We are absolutely clear, Mr. Speaker, that there needs to be continued support and increased support for the health care system. That's why a 3 percent increase to hospitals across the board in the budget was what we uh, put forward, Mr. Speaker. So again, to suggest that we are not working to solve challenges, to suggest, Mr. Speaker, that we don't recognize that hospitals need support, that long-term care needs support, Mr. Speaker, that home care needs support, that mental health needs support, Mr. Speaker, we have added support, added money in each one of those areas, and we will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that health care is a cornerstone of how we see ourselves in this province and how we see ourselves in this country. Our publicly funded yes, health care system is essential, and we will continue to support it. We will continue to increase support as the need Thank increases. You. Final supplementary. Speaker, this Premier shorted the OHA ask in the current budget by $300 million. That's what she did. Just yesterday, we released information showing that St. Joe's Hospital in Hamilton reached the dangerously high occupancy level of 139 per cent August, in August of this year. The hospital has anywhere between 5 and 31 people waiting in the emergency room every day for an inpatient bed. The premier solution for St. Joe's Hospital in Hamilton? 24 temporary beds. It would be laughable if it wasn't so terribly wrong for patients who need a proper hospital bed. Not a stretcher against a wall without a call button, without privacy, and without the decency, the dignity that people deserve in hospital. When will this love government actually get it together Question. and start fixing the problems they created in our hospital system? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. S uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the Christmas and the holiday spirit from the PC party. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that we recognize uh, the quality of the health care system we have in this province. When we look at hospital mortality rates, when we look at cancer outcomes, when we look at avoidable deaths from health outcomes compared to other provinces, compared to other developed countries, Mr. Speaker, Ontario outperforms all other provinces and is close to the top of the OECD. In fact, we have the lowest rate of potential years of life lost in Canada. We have the best five-year survival rates for prostate, breast, colorectal, and lung cancers in Canada. Our mortality Answer. rate for these same four cancers is among the best in the world. We need to be proud of the outcomes that we've achieved collectively as a province and a society, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. 
New question, the leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier. You know what we have in this province? We have the lowest number of beds per capita in hospitals. We have the lowest funding per patient in hospitals in our country. That's what we have after 14 years of Liberal government. Between April 2016 and April 2017, we should all remember that Brampton Civic Hospital treated 4,352 patients in the hallway, Speaker. The facility was overcrowded the day it opened. The Premier's complete lack of understanding about the needs of this fast-growing community is is absolutely shocking. It mirrors her complete lack of compassion about the overcrowding and hallway medicine crisis that she created all across Ontario. Does this Premier really not get Question. it, Speaker, or is properly funding hospitals simply not a priority? Well, Mr. Speaker, as we approach uh, this holiday season, I want to specifically recognize and acknowledge our health care workers across this province, our health care planners, our doctors, our nurses, uh, the frontline workers, the support workers, the administrators, the support workers that are doing an exceptional job in this health care system. And that exceptional job, Mr. Speaker, is reflected in the results that we're seeing. Mr. Speaker, we have the second highest, second best rate for access to a family doctor in the province. We have the second best survival rate for breast cancer in the entire OECD, Mr. Speaker. We need to be proud of that. Mr. Speaker, we have the Fraser Institute reported just last week that Ontario has the best wait times in the entire country. Answer. Mr. Speaker, we have wait times that are four weeks better than the second best pro province. That's thanks to our hardworking health workers. Thank you for that investment. Supplementary. Speaker, yesterday I visited the hospital for sick kids right here in Toronto. It's a world-class hospital, an incredible provincial asset, and the home to incredible professionals who provide life-saving care to tiny little babies. But even at a prestigious hospital like SickKids, they are struggling with overcrowding and with funding that just isn't keeping up. When I was there talking to moms and nurses and other health care providers, the neonatal intensive care unit was at 114 per cent occupancy. Why has this Premier driven Ontario's incredible hospitals like SickKids into an underfunding and overcrowding crisis that's hurting patients and families each and every day. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we uh we know that there is more work to be done, that there are further investments to be made. That's why, as the Premier referenced, half a billion dollars in this year's budget, half a billion dollars in last year's budget, an additional $100 million this fall invested into our hospitals, resulting in the creation of 1,200 new acute care beds, the equivalent of six community hospitals, Mr. Speaker, and other important investments like the 125 individuals who, know, who up to until last week resided in Toronto and GTA hospitals but didn't need to be there. Now they're in a rehabilitation environment, an environment which reactivates them at the Humber site of the, the Finch site of the former Humber Hospital. Mr. Speaker, these investments, and we're doing approximately 600 of those rehabilitation investments to make sure that we're investing yes, where our hospitals, their CEOs, their leadership, and the Ontario Hospital Association tells us where we need to make those investments. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, Sick, Sick Kids Hospital started yesterday with 337 patients, but they're only funded, uh, budgeted, funded uh, for 288 patients. That's what the overcrowding crisis looks like just down the street from here. There are six babies. Uh, and, all, and all of those babies have families, so six families shoved together in a single room. Nurses are almost tripping over the equipment because there isn't enough space. And now, uh, and there's also red tape that's taped around 
the baby's areas on the floor where there should be walls to prevent the spread of infection. Mm. Sick Kids is an incredible hospital, there is no doubt about it, but it has been starved, starved of operating funding by this Premier and her government. And now the Premier's temporary beds aren't the real answer, because Sick Kids Hospital is literally so full, Question. it's run out of room. When will this Premier do the right thing, make sure hospitals uh, can keep up with growth and fund the capital infrastructure expansion that kids, Sick Kids Hospital needs right now? Thank you. Seated, please. Seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, I will agree with this uh, one point, Mr. Speaker, that Sick Kids is a world class hospital. Mr. Speaker, we increased their budget this year alone by $9 million. We've added neonatal intensive care units to Sick Kids Hospital this year. We're, we, we gave them a planning grant, Mr. Speaker, so we could plan for future capacity, that we could make those necessary investments so it can continue to deliver that high quality, world class care. Those are the investments that we're making in every hospital right across this province. And I'll end by saying, Mr. Speaker, we value and deeply appreciate the work of the Ontario Hospital Association, the leadership across our hospitals, across our health care system, from the frontline worker to the CEO and everybody in between, and the volunteers that make our health care system great. We value Answer. their investments, their commitment, their passion, their compassion, especially, I think, we remember at this time of year. Thank you. The question, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Sadly, this Christmas, we have really bad news. Santa's elves and his reindeer can't work all night through. With so little time and joyful children at stake, will you give Santa an exemption to Bill 148? <laughs> Thank you, Premier. Labor. <laughs> Serve Labor. Well, Speaker, this is uh, it's going to be a lot of very happy families this Christmas, Speaker, because their mothers and their fathers will be earning, Speaker, more money. These are people that have been earning $11.60 an hour, trying to raise families, trying to buy uh, food, Speaker, trying to buy Christmas presents, trying to buy a Christmas tree, Speaker. All the normal things that we want for each and every one of our families is contained in Bill 148. Right. Everything we try to do for the people we care about when we work and come home, Speaker, is in Bill 148. And the Grinches across the aisle <laughs> voted against it. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Speaker, Santa will know who's been naughty and nice. Of course, he has his list, and he's checking it twice. The bad ones get coal. But I'm told last year he missed you. But this year he won't. Will he get his coal from a vista? Minister. And that to me. Speak to the Minister, uh, Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas everywhere we go. You know, Mr. Speaker, you look in, uh, in Ontario, you've got clean air, you've got clean electricity. You know, I can't make it rhyme, Mr. Speaker. I was trying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's all I had. But really, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, you know, Hydro One has been working hard in this province to be a better-run company, and they're doing just that, Mr. Speaker. Winter disconnections have ended. You know, Mr. Speaker, they're actually going to continue to work hard to continue to be a better company. And what we've done through our Fair Hydro plan is allow them to actually give a reduction to all of their customers in rural and northern parts of our province of anywhere between 40 and 50 percent, Mr. Speaker. And on that, that is good news, Mr. Speaker, because that is more money in the pockets of these people and like the Minister of Labour said Answer. earlier, that they can do other things with that, maybe buy more Christmas presents for their kids, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kenora, Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Hydro bills have gone up 300 per cent under this Liberal government, and families across northwestern Ontario are paying the price for decades of hydro privatization under this government and under the Conservatives before them. Now we've learned that Dryden Regional Hospital's hydro bills have increased by a staggering 44 per cent in wow. just five years. Wow. The hospital is doing everything that it can to conserve energy. They've made significant investments in retrofits yet their bills continue to soar. Why is this Premier letting down the people of northwestern Ontario and forcing our hospitals to take money out of frontline care just to cover up their soaring hydro bills? Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've actually uh, worked hard with Hydro One, which is in that area, Mr. Speaker, to reduce bills for all residential customers between 40 and 50 percent, Mr. Speaker. When I was in Atacokan early on, Mr. Speaker, that agency, that um, entity said that the bills in that community have been reduced between 34 and 40 percent, Mr. Speaker. So we're going to continue to work with these type of companies to bring forward this type of relief, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to hospitals, they have also been utilizing many of the programs that we have put in place, working with their LDCs, and have seen significant savings, Mr. Speaker, that they are now able to then put back into care. And many of these hospitals, Mr. Speaker, are talking about the, the impact that the electricity has on their overall cost, Mr. Speaker, is only 1%, Mr. Yes, Speaker. So we've got programs in place that will continue to help these, these institutions and the residents of the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Northern hospitals and northern families need a premier who cares about making life more affordable and stopping the cuts to our frontline health care. But this premier keeps letting northwestern Ontario down. Dryden Regional Hospital is suffering from sky-high hydro costs because of the privatization of our hydro system by Liberals and Conservatives alike. Our hospital is not getting the relief that it needs, so they've come up with a capital plan that would allow the hospital to go off the grid. Yet this government refuses to deliver the funding they need to implement that plan. Why is this Premier delivering one disappointment after another to the people who need health care and who also need to be able to pay their hydro bills all across northwestern Ontario? Thank you, Again, Mr. Speaker, since coming into office, we've increased hospital funding by 54 percent, allowing us to treat more patients and provide better care and reduce wait times to some of the shortest in the country, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that hospitals send 1.6 percent on average of their total operating budgets on hydro. And also, Mr. Speaker, we just invested $50 million in over 100 hospitals to make sure that they can help them retrofit, Mr. Speaker, to even reduce their bills even more, Mr. Speaker. That means that well over 90 per cent of the hospital budgets go towards the, the, the rest, Mr. Speaker, hiring nurses and doctors, keeping wait times low, and ensuring patients have access to the high-quality services that they need, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to action, when it comes to making sure that we're helping hospitals, we're helping individuals, we're helping families right across this province, Answer. we're doing it with health care, and we're doing the same with electricity, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Our government has made significant investment in the drug benefits received by seniors in recent years and continues to provide one of the most generous programs for seniors in Canada. And the seniors in my riding of Davenport are grateful for this. As part of the 2017 budget, our government is giving children and youth a better start in life by moving to make prescription medications free. I know the minister at several times has spoken about how this step in providing free access to prescription medications for all Ontario's children and youth is just the first step towards a full provincial pharmacare program. Could the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care be able to update the House on the status of OHIP Plus ahead of its official launch next month? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I have to say I am so proud and so proud of this Premier for her leadership nationally and in this province on this issue of pharmacare. And Mr. Speaker, it is true, we're only weeks away from the biggest advancement of Medicare in this province in generations, Mr. Speaker. There are only a few short weeks to go until 4,400 drugs become 
absolutely free for everyone in Ontario age 24 and under through OHIP+. Plus. And last week, we officially launched a new website where people can go and search for their medications and see that they will be available free of charge. It's important to stress that OHIP Plus will cover every single Answer. drug on Ontario's formulary. Asthma inhalers, EpiPens, diabetes test strips, oral contraceptives, cancer drugs, and drugs for Thank rare you. diseases. Fantastic. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. I, too, am also proud to be part of a team that has worked to make this historic advancement in Medicare. I want to thank you and our Premier for our leadership, your leadership, as we move to a full provincial pharmacare program. I have no doubt that this new program will improve access to prescription medications for more than 4 million children and young people and will help many families to afford the medications their children need to stay healthy. I know that much of the focus when we look at prescription drugs for youth will be focused on access to antibiotics, inhalers, and EpiPens. I think all of us in the legislature can agree how important that is. But there are often accessibility issues for medications we do not often talk about. Would the minister be able to inform the House about the full scope of health options OHIP Plus will offer? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the the reality of the Ontario drug formulary is that it will offer through OHIP Plus more independence, more opportunity, and more health for our children and youth. Diabetes test strips and insulin for low-income families struggling to pay the bills every week will save them thousands of dollars each year. Birth control for the 22-year-old young woman at college pursuing a degree. January 1st is going to be a historic day for Ontario, not just for the four million children and youth will, who will be receiving those drugs absolutely free of charge, Mr. Speaker. I want to say again just how proud I am of this Premier, this team and this government for the leadership that has been demonstrated. And This is absolutely a first and a major leap forward. We are 100 yes, percent committed to continue working with the federal government for a national pharmacare program so these benefits can be extended to all Canadians. Mr. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. No question. The member from Leeds, Grindle. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. The voters are skeptical. That is no lie. But we have to reflect and ask ourselves why. From this side of the aisle, it's plain to see. Premier, will you be accountable and sign the People's Guarantee? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is the last question period before Christmas, and I must say, I must say with much passion, we will bring in a minimum wage of $15, with or without your attention. We will lower energy rates. We will create jobs as well. This Christmas will be great for Ontario. We're working to make things swell. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary, the member from Rochelle and South. Just to the Premier. In question period, politicians they go back and forth when people want change for taxes and support for the North. So I'll ask again, because no answer was found, will you sign the People's Guarantee when I sit down? <laughs> Minister of Finance, Mr. Speaker. Finance. The halls of legislature are haunted by the ghosts of Christmas past, Mr. Speaker. They bring to us today the likeness of the miser Ebenezer Scrooge from across the aisle. <laughs> They who have wanted to make cuts to our and support our families, to deny the gifts of our, Christmas, or of our province's prosperity, to share for all. And on this side of the aisle, Mr. Speaker, we thank the Premier and the jolly red grandmothers of Ontario, <laughs> who, like Santa Claus, care for all of our children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Oh, 
Order, please. New question, the member from Windsor West. Questions to the Premier. Earlier this week, my constituent, Ida Harry, shared with me the heartbreaking experiences she has endured while trying to help get uh, help for her 12-year-old son who lives and struggles with serious mental health challenges. Ida's son has been on wait list after wait list. He has waited for psychologists, waited for beds in support centres, and waited in hospitals. Ida wrote to me, and I quote, our children are victims of the province's neglect to provide adequate mental health care for our youth. I implore the province and its officials to do something now before it's too late." End quote. On Tuesday, my NDP colleague from Hamilton Mountain introduced a motion that urges the government to eliminate mental health waitlists for children and youth. Will the Premier listen to Ida Question. and the thousands of families like her, eliminate the waitlist and do something now before it's too late for Ida's son and Thank others you. like him? Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. I, I want uh, everyone here in the legislature and uh, across the province uh, to know that uh, we're working hard to transform a system uh, that's built for young people to get the best possible services uh, necessary. We recognize we need to do more as a government, as people of Ontario, to deliver better services to young people. And we've been looking for ways to transform the system. The Moving on Mental Health strategy that we put forward a few years ago, and we backed that up initially with a $100 million investment, has gone a long way, but it's brought us to a point now where um, we do have lead agencies across the province. We're reorganizing the way service delivery is being uh, delivered on the ground. And I'm working with the Minister of Health to look for ways to further enhance youth mental health here in the province of Ontario because we want young Answer. people to get the service that they deserve when they need it. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. On, back to the Premier. On Tuesday, my colleague from Hamilton Mountain also raised the issue of youth suicides. She highlighted that the majority of people who are treated in emergency rooms after a suicide attempt are not getting the follow-ups with necessary supports. This certainly has been the case with Ida and her son. When Ida's son attempted suicide, they went to the emergency room, where they waited for six hours before speaking with a medical student and a counsellor. And after that, they were sent home. They have made numerous trips to the hospital, but have not received the support they need. Speaker, Ida asked me in her letter, and I quote, does my son need to be on his deathbed to get any help? Speaker, will the Premier answer that question for Ida? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, again, um, you know, uh, my heart goes out to all the families in Ontario that have young people that struggle uh, with mental health. Um, over the last uh, you know, 20 years, even in fact, Mr. Speaker, over the last decade, what we've seen with mental health uh, challenges here in the province of Ontario is a, a huge, huge growth, and we think that's uh, uh, partially because of the stigma, stigma that's been removed from, uh, from mental health. And we've been working hard as a government to, uh, to let people know that you know, if they need services, that they should go forward and, and, and get those services. We have 130,000 young people here in the province of Ontario that access services today. Day. We know that more is needed, and that's why we continue to invest. Um, Mr. Speaker, we've invested into uh, 72 school boards to bring in mental health leaders in all of our school boards across the province. We've provided funding to hire 770 additional Answer. community mental health workers across the province. We'll continue to do more to make sure young people get the help that they deserve. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Good morning. Uh, while the Conservatives are entertaining us with their newfound talent, I have a real policy question for the Minister of International Trade. Speaker, attracting international investment and helping business compete on a global scale is part of Ontario's plan to create opportunity and fairness for workers, businesses, people of this great province. The House has seen the great work that the Ministry of International Trade has done so far in promoting Ontario globally. I know that during these trade missions, business-to-business -business communication is integral. I also know that there is time for Minister to speak to each business and learn about their global, uh, sorry, their goal internationally. Each interaction works to promote Ontario as a great place to do business, Question. visit, and discover. 
As the trade mission to China and Vietnam included, concluded last week, could the minister share with us how more exciting deals signed? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Trinidad and for asking the question. Good Speaker, question. Ontario's plan to diversify trade is key to our continuous economic growth. It's important to remember that trade does not only involve goods. Services such as healthcare, education, and tourism are vital to trade. Trade missions provide Ontario the unique opportunity to showcase our province's leading industry, in this case, tourism. As a leader in global talent, with a GDP growth rate higher than any other G7 country and a diminishing small business tax rate, Ontario has much to offer. This is why, in partnership with Tourism, tourism Toronto, MA China has selected Toronto to host their 25th anniversary leadership conference in Ontario. Speaker, this is an incredible opportunity for Ontario, Answer. and I would, like, I would be delighted but the member from Burlington could speak more to this. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the minister for the response. And um, thanks in part to the investment that this government has made to our tourism industry, the sector has been a key economic driver to the province. I know Ontario, Toronto has competed in some of the biggest destinations in the world for Amway China bid, and it's very exciting to to have been selected. I know many of them will be visiting my downtown riding of Trinity Spadina. By choosing Ontario to host their 25th anniversary leadership seminar, MA China is giving a nod to Toronto as a world-class city. It also further demonstrates that Ontario is a competitive destination for significant conventions. National and international conventions continue to be a major economic driver in Ontario, and we look forward to welcome MA China in 2020. Speaker, can the minister speak to the benefits of this international Question. leadership conference will provide? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Minister responsible for tourism, culture and sport. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this excellent question. The news about Amway China 2020 is a direct result of our government's strategic framework for tourism. I want to thank Minister Chan and Joanne Belanger and her team at Tourism Toronto, as without their excellent collaboration and efforts, this would not have happened. We know, Speaker, that tourism is a vital economic driver for Ontario, supporting 380,000 jobs and generating over $32 billion to our economy. China is Ontario's second largest contributor of tourism spending, with over half a billion dollars coming from over 200,000 tourists. So attracting international leadership events like Amway China's 25th anniversary leadership seminar is great news. It showcases Ontario as a world-class tourism destination while promoting investment opportunities, and it will welcome over 10,000 distributors to Toronto, generating an estimated $80 million in revenue and tourism spending from Toronto to Niagara Falls. Speaker, Answer. we're delighted to welcome Amway China. 2020 to Toronto and Thank very you. excited about what this is going to do for our economy. Thank you. New question. The member from here on Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Wind turbines still go up against a town's will. Just like the Grinch ignoring councils, this gives Liberals a thrill. They swear that the turbines are all science-based, but will she admit real noise pollution proves that's just not the case? <laughs> Economic development and growth. Minister of Economic Mr. Development Speaker, and Growth. It, it is the session before Christmas, and I note with much joy the kids in our land will, ha will enjoy plenty of toy. Our unemployment rate is the lowest in years. This Christmas, we may, may even enjoy a few beers from grocery stores nonetheless. And so we wish you all the best of the season and hope that next year the opposition will engage with more reason. <laughs> Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Chatham Kent, Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Wind turbines must go, but the Liberals ignore the demands of the people as they loudly implore. In the alley of carnage, the snow piles so high, but the need for a barrier will they always deny? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's still the session before Christmas, and it's almost done. It's nice to spend time in this house and even have fun. We may be opposed to many an issue, but when we leave this place, rest assured, we will miss you. <laughs> let, us focus, 
this session on those that are in need and let us work together so Ontario can still lead. Thank you. Your question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. As the Premier knows, Parliament Oak School, the jewel of Niagara Lakes Old Town, was closed. Now the community is rallying together again to save Parliament Oak. This time they're fighting to keep the school in the old town and turn it into a community hub that gives back to the residents for generations to come. I fully support these efforts. However, DSBN has rejected an offer over the asking price from the town to buy the school, which would keep it in community hands. The town previously gave this same building to the board for free. They rejected the work done by the community to keep Parliament Oak where it is and ensure it gives back to the community. Will the Premier intervene today and ask DSBN to reconsider selling Parliament Oak School to the town so it can, can be used as a community hub for the town? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Education. Of education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member opposite for his question. I've been almost in daily dialogue with him about uh, this particular issue, and I know that he is well aware that my ministry and I are also well aware of uh, of the conversations that are happening between the school board and uh, and the town. I sent uh, a letter, in fact, to the the school board expressing um, the desire for um, for for them to work together with the town and in the spirit of how do we look at the community um, needs in this instance and uh, and support the notion of a community hub. Um, our government has, uh, has a policy, a stated policy. We have funding behind it to support community hubs uh, across this province because we know how vital these public, uh, these public uh, um, uh, locations are to communities. And, uh, and in this instance, uh, we are encouraging the school board to work together with the town. Again, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Premier. According to the Education Act, the minister has the power to regulate the sale or lease of school sites. We know that Niagara Lake has already endured the closing of Parliament Oak School. We have many community organizations that have come to the table and supported this, including the Lord Mayor, Pat Dart, the Town Council, and all of the residents of Niagara and Lake. Given that information, will the Premier stand with the Town Council of Niagara and Lake and the community and help, help us save Parliament Oak so it will remain in the old, old town for years to come? Thank you. Thank you. Minister? So, Mr. Speaker, I, I am very supportive of any solution that allows um, the use of, of this property um, for community uh, community use, and, and that's why we have a, a stated policy to support community hubs, and uh, and that's why, in fact, we've been working together with the uh, the school board and the town to um, to to really encourage them to to talk together to find a solution that best supports the the local community, and that's exactly what is happening. Um, there is, of course, a, a process uh, for uh, the disposition of properties. Uh, my understanding is that the school board has followed that uh, that particular process, but this is about uh, what is the best re resolution for the local community, and that is what uh, that's what we are focused on. That's what we're working to bring those two parties together, the school yes, board sir. and uh, and the town, to talk about how. How do we resolve this for the best use for the community thank itself, you. and we support that process? New question, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. And, uh, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, keeping with the holiday spirit, children across the province are very excited about the next few days and the next few weeks. Time off from school, presents under the trees, they have a lot to look forward to. But, Speaker, they're not the only ones who are excited about the great things that are coming. Commuters across the GTA will soon be receiving a very early Christmas present, or let's call it a sixth day of Hanukkah present. The present is a first edition as well, Speaker. It is unlike anything the region has seen before. And the best part, Speaker, after years of planning and building, we only have to wait a few more days. So, Speaker, would the minister please provide more information on what this present is, what makes it so unique, 
and why commuters in the GTA can't wait to open it on December 17th. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to begin, of course, by thanking the member from Beaches East York for being such a strong advocate for transit here in the GTA. That member is absolutely correct, Speaker. Commuters in this region will be receiving one of the best Christmas or holiday gifts I can think of that a government can offer them, Speaker, a new option for commuters to get from point A to point B. Speaker, this coming Sunday, December the 17th, the Toronto York Spadina subway extension will see its first day of revenue service. Wow. In just three days, that is, Speaker, commuters will have the opportunity to hop on board the first new subway extension Goodness. in the GTA to open up in 15 years. And if this, this, of course, Speaker, will be the first subway to cross regional boundaries. By hopping on board the Line 1 extension, commuters will be able to move between the 416 and the 905 for a single fare, Speaker. And come this January, thanks to this provincial government, that fare will be only $1.50 if you're hopping onto the GTC from GO or the Union Pearson Express. Speaker, tomorrow we'll be having a very exciting celebration with representatives from all thank levels you. of government to mark this wonderful occasion. Well, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the, the minister not only for his answer, but for this great gift he's giving, our government is giving to the people of the GTA. Speaker, I have no doubt that tomorrow will be an incredibly exciting day and that's the first ride on Sunday morning that will be something for all of us to remember. And on this side of the House, we know that the reasons to invest in transit are absolutely clear. It helps ease congestion. It promotes a better quality of life, reduces greenhouse gas emissions. It gives companies yet another good reason to invest in Ontario, and it saves commuters money. Speaker, it is clear that the TYSSE an $870 million investment made by our government will support all of these important outcomes, and that will make it money that has been very well spent. Speaker, I know this is just one of the very many transit projects that are going on in Ontario. Would the minister please provide us with more information and greater details on sure. what else commuters in the region can expect to see in the years to come? And thanks to our government's historic thank you. in transit. Sure. Thanks, Speaker, and I thank the member for his follow-up question. Of course, he is right. The Line 1 extension to York University and York Region is one part of the integrated transit map that we are building, Speaker. We're talking about Go Regional Express Rail. We're talking about the Eglinton Crosstown, the Finch West LRT, Huron, Ontario, and Hamilton LRT, Speaker. Extending Go Train service to Niagara, Speaker. Extending Go Train service to Bowmanville, Speaker. And doing so much more right across this entire region. But coming back, coming back to the Line 1 subway extension that opens up for service this Sunday, Speaker, the first train will leave the 905, will leave the city of on at 7.57 a.m. I'll be on that train with my daughters, Talia and Grace, and I strongly urge every single member here, regardless of where you live, come down to the GTA, hop on that first train. It truly is a day for transit celebration in the GTA. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, this is for the Premier. Now, we may not be the North Pole, but we are on the way there. A no man's land, we are not, but the Liberals just don't care. A great opportunity exists with many jobs for fire. Why do they refuse to develop the ring of fire? Premier. Minister, of Ener uh, Minister of Energy. Sir of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just, just like how we can rhyme off the reindeer, Mr. Speaker. I am very happy to rhyme off all of the investments that we make in Northern Ontario, Mr. Sure. Speaker, and let alone um, just let's talk about Sault Ste. Marie. So, Ms. Sault Ste. Marie, this year, $2 million for the Institute of Environment, Education and Entrepreneurship, uh, $750,000 for the Child and Family Centre at Sioux College. $900,000 for the Waterfront and Tennis Centre, Mr. Speaker. NOHFC is supporting the ARC expansion of uh, the hospice with a $1 million investment, Mr. Speaker. You know what? It just goes on and on, Mr. Speaker, in ensuring the investments that we're making in Northern Ontario, all the way from making sure we're four-laning Highway 69, making our roads safer, Mr. Speaker, with $173 million yes, in, uh, investment in that. Mr. Speaker, we're more than happy to talk about Northern Ontario because it's this government that's making Thank those you. investments. Supplementary, the member from New Thanks, uh, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Now, Speaker, we had some fun today with our question. After all, everyone has had a very busy session. So I want to end here with levity and with something light. Will the Premier join us? Wish happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and to all a good night.
Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do also want to take the opportunity to wish everyone a happy holidays, a Merry Christmas, Mr. Speaker, and a celebration of life, whatever you celebrate during this uh, season, Mr. Speaker. I also think it's a, a good opportunity for us to, uh, to acknowledge, I think, one MPP who won't be back here uh, come next year, which is the uh, uh, Sherry DeNovo MPP from Parkdale pa High Park. I want to thank you for your service. And with that, with Mr. Speaker, um, we're sure we'll see you around this place in the very near future. But uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. Have a great holiday season. Thank you. New question, the member from London West. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Speaker, 16 months ago, this Liberal government decided to impose parking fees for the use of Kamoka Provincial Park, a park that was free for Londoners to use for decades and is much loved by the estimated 100,000 people who used to visit each year. One of my constituents, Bill Boswell, was recently informed by the park superintendent that a total of $67,000 has been collected in parking fees, assuming two people per car, with each car paying for just one hour of parking, this translates into 25,000 visitors over 16 months, a drop in attendance of more than 75 per cent. Speaker, does the minister think that a paltry $67,000 was worth depriving tens of thousands of Londoners, including seniors, people struggling with mental health issues? Others on lower fixed incomes from the benefits of using this park. Thank you. Minister Resource and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you very much to the uh, member opposite for the question today. Speaker, I wanted to really start out about how Ontario Parks does fund its management programs. And all of the programs that are offered by uh, our Ontario Parks, and there are 340 of them in the province of Ontario, not all with services, but it's all funded through gate receipts, Mr. Speaker. So all of the programs, all of the trails, all of the uh, infrastructure that the Ontario Parks manages, all of the staff and all of the facilities that our visitors to our parks uh, enjoy are all paid for through the special purpose account. I know that uh, there have been many users in uh, Kamoka Park and that uh, it was unfortunate that uh, we needed to move forward with uh, another way of recouping some of the services Answer. that we've paid for that park, including new washroom facilities, new lighting, new parking lot facilities that the users Thank have you. been asking for. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, 75,000 Londoners are no longer using this park. Again to the minister, the fees of $5.25 an hour or $14.50 a day were imposed without any real consultation and with paving the only justification. Since the fees were introduced in August 2016, thousands of Londoners have signed my petition calling for the removal of the fees. The park is really only accepted accessible by car, and the data confirms that the fees are creating huge barriers to access. They are preventing Londoners from reaping the benefits of the enhanced physical and mental well-being that comes with access to the natural environment. Speaker, will the minister do the right thing and remove the parking fees from Kamoka Provincial Park? Question. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And again, what I would like to say to everybody in this House is that all of the incredible services that our Ontario parks uh, provide for the people of Ontario, all of the staff that provides uh, the resources that people enjoy when they visit the parks are paid for by gate receipts. And it's also worth noting to the member opposite that each Ontario provincial park has its own management plan, and that management plan 
plan is set in, in, in progress for many years. So I don't have the authority to do that. It is the provincial parks and their management staff that step forward. But what I can say to everybody in this House is that we have an incredible opportunity in our province to enjoy many parks, some with services, yes, some sir. without. Many visitors come to Ontario specifically to see the parks, and I want to thank everybody that thank works you. in our Ontario Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. On Tuesday, new legislation was passed titled the Building Better Communities and Conserving Watersheds Act 2017. As members of the House know from debating this legislation, this bill provides important updates to our current land use planning system as well as our conservation authorities, giving more opportunity for Ontarians to have their voices heard. What some people might not know is just how important our conservation authorities are to us here in the province. 90 per cent of Ontarians live in a watershed managed by a conservation authority. Therefore, my question to the minister is, can you tell me what changes this legislation will bring to Ontario's very important conservation authorities and how these changes will benefit the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you Derek, very much to the hardworking member from Barrie for that question. And thank you again for giving me the opportunity to talk about our great new legislation that I'm very proud of. I know just how important this new act is to so many communities around Ontario, as I see firsthand the great work that the, Co the Grand River Conservation Authority does in my own community of Grand River and Waterloo Region and Brantford, I might add, Speaker. By modernizing the Conservation Authorities Act, we've delivered some real benefits to the people of Ontario, benefits like stronger oversight and accountability for Conservation Authority decision-making. More clarity and consistency in the services that conservation authorities provide, an increased public engagement in conservation authorities to ensure the people have a voice in their local conservation authorities. Answer. These important changes are necessary to ensure the environment will be there for years to come. And Merry Christmas to all and to all a good break. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. When changes to the Ontario Municipal Board were proposed last year, the government held 12 town halls across the province to get feedback from the people of Ontario. Though the, through those town halls, we heard opinions from Windsor to Ottawa, from the GTA to Thunder Bay, and many members held town halls in their own ridings. People told us that too often the OMB doesn't consider local perspectives when it makes decisions that too many decisions went to the board and that the process was complicated for community groups. We heard that people want more say in how their communities are developed. Through Bill 139, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and the Attorney General proposed legislation that would overhaul the OMB and replace it with the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal. Bill 139 received royal assent this week. My question for the minister is, question. does Bill 139 respond to the concerns we heard during consultation? Thank you. Minister, minister of, Ma of uh, Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Well, speaker, thanks to the member for the question. Speaker. Um, in years recently past, planning was not fine, so our government decided to table Bill 139. We consulted, we discussed, and we went to committee. Bill 139 artificially delayed. What a pity. But persevere we did, knowing what was at stake, and progress, although slow, indeed we did make. With the help of MNRF and the AG, our ministry was diligent, the results plain to see. Bill 139 has received royal assent, the will of the opposition tattered and bent. <laughs> because in the end it was plain for all to see, respect and deference for local decision-making is the right place to be. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have a we do have a few points of order that have been signified, and I'll get to those in a moment. But first, I would like to take a moment to introduce um, a former twin dean of the house, the member from Carleton Grenville from the 31st, 32nd, 33rd, Carleton from the 34th, 35th, 36th, 
Lanark Carlton from the 37th, 38th, and Carlton, Mississippi Mills from the 39th, Mr. Norm Sterling. Thank you. Also in the House and had to leave was uh, Mr. Gerard Kennedy from York South in the 36th and Parkdale High Park in the 37th and 38th Parliament. As I sat in my chair to hear members speak, I could tell that the spirit had taken hold with a squeak. When you awake from home tomorrow morning, know that you will have a smile on your face. It'll be without a warning. <laughs> and, to and, to ensure, and to ensure that I do get home with a smile, my wife is in the gallery, Rosemary. I'd like to recognize the leader of the third party on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's um, actually my privilege to uh, raise on a port point of order, um, considering that this is the last day in the legislature for the member for Parkdale High Park, Sherry DeNovo. And uh, as leader of Ontario's NDP, I want to just take a quick moment to thank Sherry for all the work that she's done after many years of being a member in this legislature. And I think we would all agree. Uh, that her work, particularly on LGBTQ issues, uh, would, um, uh, is un unparalleled in any legislative uh, chamber across our country. Uh, I believe that uh, without that work, without Sherry being here, that work wouldn't have ever been done uh, from Toby's Law right up until the uh, passing of the Trans Day of Remembrance uh, just the other day. Her work on first responders and PTSD, uh, presumptive legislation, uh, her work on anti-poverty issues and social justice. Uh, it has been an amazing, amazing journey. Uh, Sherry is a passionate, committed woman who really does care about the well-being of, uh, of everyday folks, and she has put her heart and soul into her work here in the legislature, and I know uh, that her next journey uh, at, uh, at the church, uh, where she is going back to, as she says, her best love, uh, will also continue that amazing work and passion. So, Sherry, on behalf of Ontario's New Democrats, thank you so much for your service here in the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Premier, on the same point of order. Yes, same point of order, Mr. Speaker. I just want to add my voice of thanks to Sherry DeNovo for all the work that she has done for the people of Ontario and for the people of Parkdale High Park. Um, we can always, we could always count on Sherry to ask questions, to raise issues that were of serious importance to the people of this province and uh, to her community. And so we're very grateful to her for that. And I will just say, as a, as a fellow member of the United Church, often we are asked within the United Church about how we are living our faith. And I just want to say that Sherry DeNovo, without bells and whistles and without uh, flaunting liturgy, lives her faith. She, she brings her consciousness of poverty and of the needs of people to this place. She has always done that, and I wish her all the very best in the next phase of her life. Member from Nepean Carlton on the same point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. To my dear friend Sherry DeNovo, I'm really going to miss you. We've been friends uh, for the past 10 years, sort of an odd couple, but uh, but we we have had an enduring friendship that I believe will last long past the time you leave here and uh, when you go back to the cloth. Uh, a lot of people probably don't know we were elected in a by-election in the same year, and I've got a bit more seniority and starting to show in the grey hair I have on my head, but. Uh, but uh, we've, we've developed a friendship and we have a number of mutual friends and every, uh, every session we would have an opportunity or every sitting we'd have an opportunity to go out for dinner and uh, put politics aside and just talk about uh, some of the issues that uh, deal with our families. And uh, we also had an opportunity to go to Taiwan together. 
And it was a very exciting trip that the member uh, took with uh, the member from Renfrew Nipples and Pembroke, the member from Leeds and Grenville, and the former min members from Beaches, Beaches East York, and I'm not sure what, Trinity Spadina, I believe. And uh, there, it was there overseas that we put uh, partisanship aside and we were Ontarians and Canadians first. And anybody that's ever taken a trip like that with their colleagues uh, really seems to unite our core values as Canadians. And, and we certainly got to share that. Now, I'm going to tell a little bit of a tale at a school. We, uh, during that trip, we wrote a song, and we would sing it. And so Sherry decided, uh, when we got back from that uh, trip, that it would be fun at the end of the year to invite me and Steve and John to the caucus party at the end of the year for the New Democrats. And so Sherry, of course, knows a lot of talented musicians. And so she told her caucus that she had a band coming. <laughs> And her caucus thought it was the bare naked ladies. <laughs> and I think they were shocked when they one by one came down the staircase and saw these three Tories standing in Sherry DeNovo's living room to sing a very off key song. But you know what? John Yakubuski knows 6,000 songs right up here. So it was, uh, it was really good. So we came down and we had this song. And it was our group came back together again. And it was the three of us as well as the three New Democratic members. And we sang for the, 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 the caucus, and they still laugh about it. Taras and I were talking about it last week. I apologize for using the member's name speaker, but, uh, but we came down and uh, they actually said we were better than the bare naked ladies. <laughs> and we, I can't tell you this song because it was at the expense of the governing party. <laughs> But I don't think they'd be surprised. But I think I just wanted to say, because one of the things that the Premier talked about and the leader of the uh, third party is the humanity of this woman, this, this wonderful MPP who has, right up until the last week that she served here, passed a private member's bill that I was proud to co-sponsor. And so to you, my friend, I look forward to seeing you grace these halls as a, as, as a clergy person, but also as a friend to every member here. And to that, I want to conclude by wishing her a Merry Christmas, as well as all of my colleagues. Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Energy, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my point of order is uh, a little less formal. I need to correct my record. Or, earlier, I said <laughs> earlier I said uh, hospitals are receiving $50 million in funding for energy retrofit upgrades. I should have said, Mr. Speaker, the number is actually $64 million. And I also would like to introduce Jeremy Dunton from my constituency office. Thank you, Minister of Education. <laughs> Minister of Education. Oh, sorry, Speaker. Um, Speaker, I would really just uh, take this opportunity to introduce uh, Priyanka Nasta, who is from my constituency office here today. Wow. Minister of Community, Services, Community Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just now I mentioned the Planning Council, and I'd like to recognize them. You've all been mentioned, but you weren't here. Thank you for your good work. Thank you very much, Speaker. Delighted to introduce a couple of uh, individuals who work in my constituency office, Francesca Cesario and Alessia Ricciuti, who are in the West Gallery. And I believe we're also, we are also joined by York University student Marzi Agadi. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much, Speaker. I also want to uh, welcome and introduce the very hardworking staff from my community office. Please welcome Jessica Dawson, Terry Lynn Robinson, and Chantal Aubertin at Queen's Park. Member from Parliament, Norfolk. For a minor point of order, something I've always wanted to do, I'm out of water. Uh, apologies to good King Wenchless. Hither page and stand by me. Member <laughs> <laughs> from Member from Beach. <laughs> Member from Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. I wanted to also welcome Mr. Fisher. He taught my Chief of Staff, Dave Belmore, and his son, Clark, and I wanted to welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Finance. Mr. Speaker, I just saw behind me uh, my constituency office who is here, and they've been doing an excellent job in Mississauga South. Brenda Armstrong, Kevin Draper, and Lucas Alves, welcome to Queen's Park, and thank you for all the attention. Um, <clears throat> we do have a vote. Uh, and, <laughs> 
we, we, we don't want to keep the lieutenant governor waiting, although the democracy of old said that they had to wait. So anyway, that's, uh, we do have something else to do uh, after. Uh, so uh, please stay by after the lieutenant governor is finished. I'd appreciate it very much. Uh, we have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 177, an act to implement budget measures to enact and amend various statutes. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
members, please take your seats. All members, take your seats, please. On December 13, 2017, Mr. Doduca moved third reading of Bill 177, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Darmer. Ms. Darmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mrs. Jassy. Mrs. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the court. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Ms. Should be song. Should be song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Sat. Ms. Sat. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Shimanta. Ms. Shimanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 48, the nays are 37. The ayes being 48, the nays being 37, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. We resolve that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. Government House Leader. Speaker, her honor rates.
Pray be seated. May it please your honour. The Legislative Assembly of a province has its present meetings therefore, thereof passed certain bills to which, in the name and on behalf of the said Legislative Assembly, I respectfully request your honour's assent. The following are the title of the bills to which your honour's assent is prayed. An act to proclaim the month of November, Lebanese Heritage Month. Loi proclamant le mois de novembre, mois de patrimoine libanais. An act to establish the Lung Health Advisory Council and develop a provincial action plan respecting lung disease. Loi criant le conseil consultatif de la maladie pulmonaire et visant l'élaboration d'un plan d'action provincial et légal des maladies pulmonaires. An act to proclaim the Trans Day of Remembrance. Loi proclamant la journée de souvenir trans. An act to proclaim Ontario Craft Beer Week. Loi proclamant la semaine de la bière artisanale en Ontario. An act to proclaim Korean Heritage Month. Loi proclamant le mois du patrimoine coréen. An act to proclaim Lauren Harris Day. Loi proclamant le jour de Lauren Harris. An act to amend or repeal various acts and to enact three new acts with respect to the construction of new homes and ticket sales for events. Loi modifiant ou abrogeant diverses lois et édictant trois nouvelles lois en ce qui concerne la construction de logements neufs et la vente de, bi de billets d'événement. An act to implement measures and to enact and amend various statutes. Loi visant à mettre en œuvre les mesures budgétaires et à édicter et à modifier diverses lois. An act to revive James Guy Limited, an act to revive Silver Merrill Corporation, an act to revive Dr. Marchand Optometry Professional Corporation, an act to revive 1428501 Ontario Limited, an act respecting the Beechwood Cemetery Company, an act to revive 1701423 Ontario Inc an act to revive 1729293 Ontario Inc., an act to revive Jetterance Canada Limited, an act to revive J. Van Elson Holdings Limited, an act to revive Streetwise Holdings Limited, an act to revive 608524 Ontario Inc. In the name of Her Majesty, Her Honour the Lieutenant Governor doth assent to these bills. Au nom de Sa Majesté, son honneur, la Lieutenant Gouverneur sanctionne ces projets de loi. Mr. Speaker, if I may, this has been a long, busy, and memorable year as we have all commemorated and celebrated Ontario and Canada 150. I thank you for your contribution to all of those events. It is a time to wish all of you a happy Christmas, happy holidays, a wonderful time with your family and friends, and a nice break. And may I also wish all of you, each and every member, uh, a year ahead of good health, happiness, and peace. Thank you. How to bring sad news. It always has been difficult for me, but I have to announce to the House that this is the last day for this set of pages. We want to thank them for their wonderful contribution to this lovely place and thank them and wish them a Merry Christmas. your indulgence. I want to uh, thank all of you. <clears throat> I know how hard you work. Not a lot of people know how hard you work. 
but I do. And I want to thank every member and all of your families for the wonderful work that you do, not just here, but in the communities. As this is my last Christmas as Speaker and as MPP, I offer you <clears throat> my commitment to continue to spread the word at how hard you work and the job you do seven days a week. So I wish for you, on behalf of my wife, who's here, my family, Merry Christmas. Point of order, the Premier. On behalf of all of the members of the Legislature, I want to thank you because we know how hard you work because we make you work that hard. <laughs> so we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a great holiday. Thank you. Thank you. On a personal note, I want to echo the very kind words that were spoken about my friend, <clears throat> Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo, as you continue your journey. Thank you for the passion that you've given all of us. Thank you for showing that people count. I appreciate you. <clears throat> there being no further deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>